everyone. <laughs> Does everyone have coffee? Does everyone have cake? Does everyone have alfajores in their belly? Well, welcome to Creative Mornings, everyone. This month's theme, Invest, was chosen by our chapter in Hong Kong and illustrated by Bao Ho. I'd like to bring a very close friend of Creative Mornings, Ari, to the stage. Give a big welcome to Ari. Today I wanted to tell you a little bit about the investments that I've made over the years. You guys probably read a little bit of my bio and some of the different things that I do. Uh, but to start, I want to tell you about the payoff from one of the biggest investments I've made. So I can still imagine that day, you know, if I close my eyes, I can smell the fresh paint, I can hear the music, I can hear people talking, the sounds of Oakland streets, noises, people's conversations. And I was super happy because I was standing in my very own shop after months and months of hard work, uh, lots of lots of money <laughs> involved. Um, and I felt like I finally did it. Like that was the moment that paid off from all of my energy investment, my time investment. Um, and it was probably one of the happiest days of my life. But before that day, I was met with quite a bit of uh, concern, you know, very gentle friends saying, are you sure about this thing? You, you don't want to keep your job job, maybe? Um, <laughs> and the concern was loving, but they all kind of fell in the same three camps. So when I said I'm going to open up an American-made brick and mortar shop in downtown Oakland, I'd get a lot of confused looks. And the first concern was like, don't you know we don't make anything in America anymore? Have you heard about China? Right? <laughs> and I'd be like, OK, OK, like I understand like a lot of things aren't made here anymore, but that doesn't mean literally nobody's making things here anymore, right? American-made manufacturing has made a comeback in a big way. If you've heard about things like Shinola, um, they're great brands actually trying to encourage people to have a decent living via making. The second big concern that I would hear was about brick and mortar retail. People would say, do you know about Amazon? <laughs> that was always the funniest one to me. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I think I've heard of that little shop called Amazon. Um, but people would, you know, tell me brick and mortar is dead, nobody's going to shops anymore. Don't you want to maybe start an e-commerce store? That'd be a little bit easier, right? But the reality is that we've seen now, six or five years later, uh, that it's not necessarily all retail is closing. Malls are closing, big box stores are closing, but small mom and pop shops are doing better than ever. Street retail really is the, the thing of the future. Um, it's where we build community. It's where you, when you visit a new city, you're super excited to be able to go into those little boutiques. The third concern I would hear was about Oakland. And this was the one that would actually make me mad. So people would say, Oakland, are you scared? <laughs> what? what does that even mean? I live in downtown Oakland. So people would say, oh, you know, Oakland's a little rough. I don't know if you know about Oakland in the 80s. And I'm like, yeah, like I know, okay, guys, like chill out. Um, but people would be concerned. They're like, Oakland doesn't have shopping. Oakland doesn't have anything. And when I'd be met with all these concerns, you know, I, I think people meant it out of love. But uh, the quick answer that I would give them that would kind of shut things down when they would say, why are you going to build an American-made brick-and-mortar shop in Oakland? My answer is $2 billion. So $2 billion is how much Oakland loses every year in retail leakage. Does anyone know what retail leakage is? It's a kind of weird sounding term, but it, <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not the best branding for that term. Um, but retail leakage is essentially people spending money outside of Oakland. So these are people who live here, work here, they should be buying things like clothes, everyday goods, you know, cars, washer dryers, all of that. That's $2 billion that we lose annually. That's a huge opportunity, right? So it's not that retail is dead, it's not that Oakland is terrible, um, it's not that American made can't happen, it's that there isn't a supply right now. And so when we think about investment, that's what we call an outsized opportunity, right? Has anyone ever gone to like a startup conference or investment VC thing? That's what they always talk about, right? Your TAM, your total accessible market. It's uh, <laughs> these fancy terms that they love to use. But $2 billion is a lot of money to have out there. And so when we think about that, you know, a lot of people didn't necessarily see the opportunity in the way that I did. And I think a lot of it is because Oakland had been underestimated, right? And I think it still is today. I mean, a lot of times people think it's a little bit cooler now, uh, but it's still not 
you know, people still go, Oakland, I'm not quite sure about that, right? Have you all heard that from people? Yeah. Being in business for five years was an accomplishment, and we've been written up in 7x7, seven seven. we've been in Oakland Magazine, SF Chronicle. So this is what I show all the people who said, are you sure about brick and mortar American-made retail in Oakland? Yeah. I also want to point out, this is like my favorite press piece ever. Those are my dogs. They, <laughs> Park Post wrote about them because I had a sign on my door that says like, all well-behaved dogs welcome, especially pit bulls. So I feel like an especially proud dog mom. So to explain how I was able to see that opportunity, we have to go back to baby Ari in Hawaii in the 90s. Yeah, that's me. I look exactly the same, which is awkward. Uh, <laughs> I was fortunate in, as a little kid. Um, I went to a private school on scholarship, um, which meant that I was not exactly like all of my classmates. Um, you know, I grew up in a single family home. Uh, my mom didn't necessarily make a lot of money as a nurse. Um, and that's not what my private school classmates were like, right? I was wondering, why do they all have two parents? Why do they all have new things when they want them? Um, and so I started actually, and this sounds a little crazy for like a little kid, but I guess I've been a little quirky, um, is I started looking into census data, which, <laughs> 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 it, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's 2020, so it's a census year, so you guys fill that out. But, you know, I started actually looking into census data and realizing, uh, you know, a lot of the things that uh, my life revolved around was reflected in that data. Um, if you all walked here from the Franklin side of things at the California Endowment, you probably saw that big sign that says, you know, depending on what your zip code is, your life expectancy is 10 to 15 years different, right? So that's a huge, that's, that's scary, right, for people who are in uh, zip codes that aren't as well funded. They don't have those good health expectancies, those good health outcomes. And so, you know, as I'm looking through this data, uh, you know, my, my family's story is told through that. Um, I grew up, at, you know, like I said, in a single family household. I'm Japanese, black, and Puerto Rican, all of which the census data says is kind of a strike for <laughs> my health outcomes and just general success outcomes. Um, and even in looking at something like this, which is my great grandfather's uh, registration card, you know, we can see a history of colonialism, right? He lives, on, he works at the Honolulu Plantation Company. And this isn't that long ago. This was maybe, this was in the 1890s, right? So only a few generations back. But as I looked through some of this data and I saw that everything about me, one of those uh, features was, you know, in terms of investment, a risk. Each, each one of those was a hit. So I kept doing research. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, funny enough, I didn't have internet in my house until like a little bit later in life. But anyway, um, so I would go through the census data. You know, I had some good library teachers who would show me how to do some of these things as like a weird little kid being like, can you tell me more about this? So <laughs> also fun fact is that I asked my mom to send me pictures of me as a little kid and I thought she would just scan the picture. She scanned the whole <laughs> album page. <laughs> which is kind of a cool aesthetic. I feel like Instagram should maybe make that a filter. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but, you know, so knowing all of this about my statistics and what my odds are, um, of course, that would make you kind of sad at first, right? Like, this is a, th me as like a little kid thinking this is a crystal ball. This is my future. I'm not going to have educational achievement. Uh, economically, I probably won't have a lot of mobility. Uh, in terms of business ownership, that's kind of out of whack back then. But the upside is that as being an underdog, you really don't have anywhere to go but up, right? And I see a lot of that reflected in Oakland too. Oakland's been so um, underestimated for so long that now that we're seeing some of the upswing, of course that's gonna happen, right? We only can go up. So after all of that research, I basically decided that architecture was gonna be the way that I solve some of these problems, right? So I was and again, a weird little kid looking up census data being like, I'm going to be an architect. Um, but this was one of the first big investments that I made in my education. So when I was 17, I moved from Kapolei, Hawaii to San Francisco, which in retrospect was a little crazy because I'd only left Hawaii once when I was 10, um, to come to California, funny enough. 
Um, so that was the first big investment. And I think for a lot of immigrant families, you know, that's typically the thing that's seen as more responsible. You're supposed to go to school, get a good education, get a good job, follow that path. So I went to architecture school at USF. This is my class. And Hannah, one of my favorite teachers. And through architecture school, you know, we did a lot of um, different community involved projects. So we would have actual real life clients. We weren't just designing, you know, theoretically, we were actually like working with our community. And I was, as I was doing some of that, I realized architecture maybe isn't the thing that's gonna solve all of these problems, right? If you're not really in this world, you don't understand that there's something called city planning. <laughs> and so from architecture school, I was able to see that actually a lot of the determinants of my life they weren't necessarily coming from architecture, but they were coming from master plans made decades before I was born. You know, I grew up in affordable housing in Kapolei. Anyone from Hawaii here or familiar? Ah, okay. Do you, so Kapolei is a weird place in that uh, it's a sort of invented town. It didn't exist before the 90s. It used to be a brownfield site for sugarcane. Uh, ooh. Ooh. Okay. I have some ancestors coming up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Kapolei was a brownfield site. Um, and I remember even growing up, you know, they would burn the extra sugar cane and there would be like burnt sugar cane in my backyard. Like that's how, um, you know, industrial that space was. Um, and of course, like many poor brown bodies, we we're the first ones to go into those contaminated sites. Right? They built the affordable housing first, then they follow up with the market stuff, then they follow up with services. Um, so that's something that I've been sort of enmeshed in and realized that city planning is actually where a lot of those decisions were made. So I went to planning school, my second big investment. Go Berkeley, go Bears. <laughs> and so while I was in planning school, I had done a report for the economic development office here in Oakland. Um, and one thing that stood out to me was actually that retail leakage number. Um, we were looking at the Affordable Care Act and how that initiative would affect Oakland's economy, but the retail leakage number is what kept standing out to me. Um, and so during school, I kind of was trying to figure out like, where do we, where do we have these levers? Where can we make change uh, to the fact that there isn't retail, to the fact that we're losing all this money, we're losing good entry level jobs. I mean, there's a lot missing there. And I couldn't find the levers. And so once I finished grad school, I decided I'm gonna go and do something kind of crazy. Um, and then I started Viscera. We believe that creativity is our humanity. We strive to inspire with grit, integrity, and generosity, all while seeking ease and balance in everyday life. Our jewelry line is all designed in-house and customizable, so we can create a keepsake to mark the special moments in your life. Our ethically made clothing line is designed with comfort and ease in mind without sacrificing style. Our V by Viscera line is inspired by nature. It's made with clean, pure, and natural ingredients, so you can take time for self-care every day. So Tiny Oak Media actually made that video for me, so shout out, thank you. Um, after I made you know, my second big investment, first being education, second being the store, um, I realized there is actually a much bigger gap too in terms of needing to invest in our community. So through the five years of having the shop, we've always offered pop-up space to new and emerging entrepreneurs. Um, we've had probably three dozen different entrepreneurs pop up and super happy to report that four of them have turned into real brick and mortar businesses since. Yeah. <laughs> so these are some of the people, um, Shop Neutral Ground, she opened up uh, her shop in San Francisco in Lower Haight. Um, the Consistency Project, she has a new shop in Brooklyn. Um, and then Golden Rust is right here in Piedmont. So you all didn't know I was here to just plug my friends. Uh, <laughs> so that's one thing, you know, with, with being able to see that opportunity in Oakland and being able to invest in our community, me having one shop can balloon into investing into so many other entrepreneurs' growth and, and actually like real good jobs in our neighborhood. And to that end, I also uh, became a part of the Oakland Indie Alliance, um, which was mentioned a little bit earlier. So the Oakland Indie Alliance is a member-run nonprofit organization that helps tell the public about small businesses and that they should, should support independent uh, restaurants, retailers. Um, we even have a wellness group now, so go to your local acupuncturist. Um, and we're about 300 members strong now. So 
you know, Oakland Indie Alliance is something that I'm super passionate about. We've worked with tech equity, um, and we want to be a powerful force for that investment in Oakland. To that end, I also started my own design studio called Viscera Studio, where I work with other small business owners to help them come up with all the creative parts of their business. You know, knowing that I've been through that gap between when you have an idea and you have the actual investment, knowing that you really need somebody who can kind of help you maneuver what's usually a pretty tricky and time and energy and money intensive uh, project. And this brings me to my fourth big investment. So how many of you do like community engagement work? Yeah. How many of you have been burnt out? <laughs> I think we're like 90 out of 100 there, right? Um, so in doing this work for community investment and trying to you know, help people know about why they should shop local, helping other entrepreneurs, I really noticed that I wasn't necessarily investing in myself. It can be really exhausting to feel like you're always holding that flag and holding that space for everyone. And you know, after having a business for a few years, it gets lonely, right? Like we have entrepreneurs in the room, you know how hard it can be um, to do all of those things. And at some point I realized that the investment in myself was missing and my own creativity was missing. And so kind of by accident, I started doing murals. So this is the first mural I did in my shop. I was avoiding doing my taxes. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, thanks Uncle Sam. Um, <laughs> so. You know, I really needed to put some time and energy into my own creative endeavors. Like, it can't all be about trying to, you know, play Captain Save a Ho for lack of a better word, right? Like, you always are trying to do so much, and it can be really exhausting if you don't have a creative outlet. And um, so that was probably about a year, year and a half ago. And so since I've done a couple other murals, this is at Cafe Encina back there. So, you know, the investment that I've put into my community has been put back into me in terms of my art. So we have lots of uh, neighbors who are really excited to support art and uh, you know we're building our community even stronger. And most recently, this is the heart that I did uh, for the San Francisco General Foundation. Yeah, this is in Union Square, y'all. <laughs> the funny thing is this dog has more Instagram followers than me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's really something. And so, you know, this was what I needed for myself. I needed to be able to invest in my own creative energies, my own outlets, and have a, a decent balance. Um, and so, you know, having known that now, this is a little bit of a vision for what can happen in, for investment in the future of Oakland. So this is the big idea for where we're going next. Um, it's vertical integration, which, again, is not a great sexy term, just like retail leakage. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the idea is that we want to build a space that can have retail, it can have manufacturing, and it can have design. So this is really what I want to build as an infrastructure for both my business and for my community, for makers and designers and entrepreneurs who want to be able to have that system, that supportive network, a place of actual investment for that creative community. And. Um, before, before we close out, I kind of want to leave you all with a question, you know, uh, where are the places that you can invest in your community? Where can you invest in yourself? Because I think ultimately we all want to do so much good in the world, and you only can do that when you operate from a place of, you know, inner peace, as like corny as it sounds, right? We all need self-care, and uh, the quote that I'd like to leave you all with is Audre Lorde. And she says, self-care is not an act of indulgence, it's an act of political warfare. And so that's something we all really need to engage with, especially now more than ever. So, you know, question yourself, where can you invest in yourself, where can you invest in your community, and what can we all do collectively? Thank you. <laughs>